Hello, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Thank you for being here. It's my great pleasure and honor to uh, welcome today for this launch briefing uh, Professor Mohamed Mahmoud Oul Mohamedou, who is a professor of international history and politics here at the Graduate Institute. Uh, he's also the chair of the Department of International History and Politics and director of executive education. Previously, um, he was the associate director of the program on humanitarian policy and conflict research at Harvard University. And he's the author of a trilogy on the post 11 September. So this trilogy is composed of, well, the first book, Contre Croisade, Le 11 September et Le Retournement du Monde, which came out in 2004. The second one is Understanding Al-Qaeda, Changing War and Global Politics, which was published in 2011. And finally, A Theory of ISIS, Political Violence and the Transformation of the Global Order, which came out in 2018. Professor Mohamedou holds a PhD in political science from the City University of New York. His research focuses on political violence and transnational terrorism, the transformation of warfare, state building, transitions to democracy and racism. He is also the recipient of the 2021 International Studies Association Global South Distinguished Scholar Award. So I think we can't have a more competent speaker today to talk about 9-11 20 years on. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mohamedou. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julie, for your very kind welcome. I'm, I'm very happy that uh, you were kindly able to chair our discussion today and very much look forward to our conversation. Um, good afternoon, um, everyone. Many thanks for taking the time to be here with us today physically and online, and I greatly appreciated this. Uh, looking forward very much to the conversation we'll, we'll be having. I have some prepared remarks for you, um, and then I'm very happy to have the exchange with Julie afterwards um, and your questions and, uh, and comments. In his unfinished work entitled Defying Hitler, which had been written in 1939 and published after his death, the German historian Sebastian Hafner asks the following question, what is history and where does it take place? Hafner's book, which interestingly only came out for the first time in 1999, two years before the September 11, 2001 attacks, was a recounting of and a reflection on the series of events that came to engulf Germany since 1914 and the subsequent rise to power of the National Socialist Party after 1933. In many ways, we can consider it as an early example of what we can call a form of in-situ history. As we go through events, periods, eras, tracts of times, however we define them, both as actors and as observers, indeed as students of social sciences and practitioners of international affairs, the nature of our relationship to history much like Hafner had sought to observe the events around him, is neither an easy nor a straightforward thing. Often, in fact, it remains largely a matter of perception and deciphering, and sometimes of blindness and amnesia. History teaches us, but it has no pupils, had already answered Antonio Gramsci to Hafner's question 20 years earlier in his 1919 famous letters from prison. And so it would appear that to historicize matters, we have both to be good students, never indulging forgetfulness, but also to be arduous investigators, detectives, as it were, of our own history as it plays out before our eyes and around us. Such questions are particularly pregnant today. On the morning of Tuesday, September 11, 2001, the transnational non-state armed group, Al-Qaeda, which had been based in Afghanistan, a group that had been formed in 1988 at the tail end of the Soviet-Afghan war, 
led by a Saudi millionaire, Usama bin Laden, and an Egyptian surgeon, Ayman al Wahiri, dispatched a group of 19 hijackers who conducted a series of four large-scale, near-simultaneous attacks, plane attacks, on the American cities of New York and Washington, killing approximately 3,000 people and destroying the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. The United States, then under the George W. Bush administration, declared a so-called global war on terror and embarked the next month in a series of extraterritorial military operations around the world, invading Afghanistan in October of that year, only leaving it earlier this month of September 2021, and Iraq in March 2003, intervening in the meantime in Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Syria, and across the Sahel. The years that followed and that we lived through, our in situ history as it is, have come to be referred to as the post 9-11 world or the post 11 September era. This period is possibly still going on. Arguably, and this is a question we will ask ourselves today, the world has not yet exited or at least exited fully from this historical moment, which has already lasted 20 long years. For all the rapid mainstreaming of the phrase 9-11, post 9-11, and its normalization across academia, policy making, journalism, what however precisely is the post 9-11 world? What are its contours? How different is it from say the post Cold War era, the other major historical moment that came immediately before it? Does the spirit indeed mark the end of that interregnum that played out in the 1990s with major geopolitical events such as the Gulf War, the Balkan Wars, the Rwanda genocide, and the Kosovo NATO intervention, just to name a few? Is this period the culmination or a continuation of those events and changes, and if so, in what way? Above and beyond, how can 20 years be described in a in reference to a single day, 9-11. When you speak of September 11th in the country of Chile, this conjures up other imagery, specifically the coup that led to the rise of Pinochet in that country and the end of the specific democratic regime that had been in place at the time. Indeed, a single terrorist operation, however extraordinary in its magnitude and nature, and there is no downplaying the importance of those attacks. Finally, is there a distinct analytically discernible, sui generis possibly, in nature to the past 20 years? And if so, what would that be and what would be the characteristics? Attempting to provide answers to these and related questions, one is in effect raising wider interrogations about the nature of history itself and relying on what the Palestinian American literary critic Edouard Said once termed, quote, the techniques of disenchantment and demystification. Primarily, in the case at hand, a critical deconstruction of the architecture that the global war on terror has successfully introduced in our very conceptualization of the world around us. This also behooves us, behooves us to move away from linear history. In a book entitled, We Now Know, Rethinking the Cold War, published a few years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, one author writes, for instance, in such a traditional linear fashion, which is not necessarily problematic, but revealing in its perspective, quote, the end of the Cold War makes it possible for the first time to begin writing its history from a truly international perspective. Do we, I ask, alternatively have to wait and until when to write a history of the post 9-11 period? Can we not start investing and investigating in something akin to what I term in situ history? We already know Thinking the 9-11 history would be the descriptive title of this book. And so what do we know? And where does this history fit in the inevitable Brodellian longer term perspective? Or the incipient question. In addition to the fact that one is writing in effect two related but different things. The events of 9-11 itself, that's the story of 9-11, the history of that. But then the history also of that which came after it. That is the aftermath, the long complex possibly still playing out, as I said, the long shadow of these momentous events themselves. To add complexity, how open-ended again is this period? When do we stop talking about the post 9-11? Have we entered the new phase? 
what would be the markers, and I would submit we possibly have already a strong contender, which is, of course, the post-corona or post-COVID-19 moment, the current pandemic being such a, a strong and logical contender. A project of this kind allows us to explore other avenues beyond what is traditionally understood as history of, say, World War II, Vietnam. It would be an examination closer to phenomena rather than merely events or crisis, as we have tended, in my view, to excessively think of 9-11, the terrorist attack, the security dimension. This would be a history of larger dynamics, say of decolonization or history of racism, a history of fear, a history of style, a history of humanitarianism, or of time. These are the dimensions that we have been missing. This is because I submit to you the post 9-11 world is raising questions that contrary to common understanding are not solely matters of geopolitics or security, as they are so often understood to be or yet again the latest dynamic in international relations. As a profoundly post-modern moment, this phase is archaeological and architectural. It is about the order of the nature, it's about the nature of the order itself. It has a consequential provenance, everything that led up to 9-11, and it has a built-in order, one that is, I argue to you, societal, ethical, political, and eminently individual. 9-11 is both a global and an intimate experience. If, as we will see, the main characteristic of the post-9-11 world is one of dystrophies, the question arises, are these defects new in the sense of asking, have they materialized ex nihilo? Or are they a return to older such disorders, making a comeback and acquiring a sort of hybridity in their expression? Or do we have to shed the history as sections approach, step back, and see rather a form of continuity in, say, for instance, the nature of power, the nature of resistance in, the, in such dynamics. As noted, the past 20 years are, in effect, one steady sequence of degeneration of the terms of exchange on, around global affairs. A series of degeneration of the terms of exchange around global affairs. Amin Ma'alouf diagnosed this shipwrecking of civilizations, le naufrage des civilisations, in an essay logically culminating two other such texts which the French Lebanese novelist had authored reflecting on the same period. The Murderous Identities, Les Identités Meurtrières, published in 1998, before 9-11, interestingly, and The Derangement of the World, Le Dereglement du Monde, published in 2009. Writing in between a novel, The Disoriented, Les Désorientés, the title of which is equally revealing for our analysis of the overarching mindset of these years. If you think about it, most of the recent international conferences, notably on security and international affairs, and across academia looking at these matters, have had as a lead themes these very terms, disorder, chaos, collapse. And so the second lead themes of this year's is the one of hatred and mistrust and antagonisms, ever more existential, ever more cultural, ever more personal. The Indian essayist Pankaj Mishra calls this an age of anger, accurately capturing the zeitgeist thus, and I quote him, grisly images and sounds continuously assault us in this age of anger. The threshold of atrocity has been steadily lowered since the first televised beheading in 2004. The racism and misogyny routinely on display in social media and demagoguery in political discourse reveal what Nietzsche, speaking of the man of ressentiment, called a whole realm of subterranean revenge, inexhaustible and insatiable of, in outbursts. There is, continues Mishra, a pervasive panic which does not resemble the centralized fear emanating from despotic power. Rather, it is the sentiment generated by the news media and amplified by social media that anything can happen anywhere to anybody at any time, highlighted in the original text. The sense of a world spinning out of control is aggravated by the reality of climate change, which makes the planet itself seem under siege from ourselves." End of quote. At a meta level, we see, therefore, that what we have is a symphony of disorder and mistrust. This is what the world after 9-11 sounds like. Still, the sound of globalized perplexity, as I would call it, is arguably ahistorical because such disorderliness 
and collapse of doubt would imply that the pre-9-11 world had things standing in order and it trusts. And therein lies the difficulty of writing this history of our era, namely the investigation of these questions, their nature, one of collapse, as I argue to you, without necessarily misrepresenting the shortcoming in that argument that would present the previous era idealistically as desirable and a just order, for clearly it was not. The current debate about the collapse of the liberal order presented by over idealistically, for instance, by say Harvard's Stephen Walt, or calls for its replacement and return to great power politics is misleading and in alignment with a long problematic tradition of Eurocentric and North-centric international relations. For the record, the liberal order grew out of colonialism and around the world it coexisted with social injustice, economic dispossession, racism, poverty, discrimination, exclusion, and military interventions. Its replacement since the mid-2010s by Trumpian and Putinian great power politics would bring even more of that elitism undergird by soft and real violence, as we have already been seeing. The post-9-11 world has that quality that it starts off as a military march. If it had a musical theme, motif, it would be Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries, or probably more appropriately, given the pop culture dimension of this era, John Williams's Star Wars Imperial March. The era also starts off by emphatically giving us, quite explicitly, the keys to its own program. This will be a war, and it will be global, and it will not be pinned down to a given enemy as that would be too limitative. In other words, it's just as much driven by projecting its imperial power for its own sake. That imprecision, that tactical imprecision, was brilliantly and conveniently associated with that most elusive of concepts, terrorism. Though it occupies a central place in this narrative, to confine the history of the post-9-11 world to the global war on terror would be, however, limitative. That was the central initial event, after the attacks themselves, of course, not the whole play. The global war on terror gives us, however, the tempo and the locus and the period that comes precisely after these events of that specific day. Accordingly, the very project of the global war on terror speaks to the nature of our times as if both objectively reflecting them and subjectively seeking to mold them. The post 9-11 era was both the aftermath of conflict and war itself. It has this dual nature. It provided us with, or rather forced on us, a layered and replayed conflict reality. As vividly shown in the human rights abuses in the Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo prisons and the rationalization of the practice of torture, the single most important aspect of that policy for the global war on terror is nothing more than a specific policy by a specific administration gone global, is the official and explicit abuse of human rights. In an essay in The New Yorker entitled How the War on Terror is Being Written, Ben Taub reminds us, quote, that the interrogation program launched in the wake of 9-11 represented one of the gravest breaches of medical, medical ethics since the Nazi medical experiments during Second World War. And also noting, he continues, that efforts to shine out, to shine light rather on government misconduct are not only a matter of moral reckoning or of learning of past mistakes. They are necessary to puncture conspiratorial narratives. What took place when the United States established directive control of Iraq in April 2003, which is the second big event in that 9-11 history beyond the Afghanistan dimension, after it had launched a military invasion on March 20 of that country, without the authorization of the United Nations Security Council, constituted an update of earlier colonial practices. The US invasion set the stage, notably due to its brutality, for the birth of the Islamic State, above and beyond what Al-Qaeda gave the Islamic State. The invasion was illegal, and it was motivated by national and personal emotions at the level of President Bush, led by po political ca calculation, and it constituted a strategic miscalculation, as is so clearly evident 20 years later. Specifically, the Iraq question was totally unrelated to the 9-11 attacks. Iraq was not a terrorism menace to the United States. As the CIA itself has stated before the invasion, the Saddam, regime, Saddam Hussein regime did not hold any nuclear weapons, and the United Nations Security Council did not authorize the use of force by any member state in relation to that issue. Regardless, the United States, with the support of the United Kingdom, invaded the country, arrested its president, took over its political, military, and civilian administration, 
installed a government it had handpicked, altered the laws of this nation, secured control over its resources, positioned troops throughout the land until December 2011, with about 73% of all active U.S. soldiers around the world having been deployed there or in Afghanistan, and dispatched them anew after 2014, while building the largest U.S. embassy in the world in the heart of that country's capital. More importantly, according to the Iraq body count, 268,000 violent death, deaths occurred as a result of these actions since 2003, out of which 190,000 were civilian deaths. The rapid fall of the Ba'ath regime gave way to a lawlessness that was foundational in nature and which has not disappeared since 18 years later. If then the US occupation of Iraq holds some of the crucial keys to the nature of the post 9-11 world, it is because it has created a new type of control ladies and gentlemen, anchored in the past, but also embedded in a contemporary type of modern dispossession, which maintains the appearance of the legality of things and the pretense of sovereignty. Liberated, quote unquote, democratized, self-ruling Iraq was a message beamed to Iraq, to the United States, and to the world to conceal the backstage control of the actors and the dispossessing nature of the process, a lead theme in the current era and one also not solely practiced by the United States. A client state of the United States, Saudi Arabia, would go on to do the very same in Yemen. If the post 9-11 world cannot be confined to the global terror, as I argue to you, it also cannot be limited to the actions of the United States, and I want to insist on that, however impactful they are and continue to be. What can be observed, in effect, is that the United States merely op opened or reopened a Pandora's box and pushed back the limits of the acceptable and the unsayable, for that matter, that which was on its way to become unacceptable, at least. Particularly in light of the advances, and there were advances in the 90s about international norms, human rights, political liberalization, civil society, gender equality, as well as environmental health and anti-discrimination efforts. This eating away at that and other values played out in North America, in Europe, in Latin America, in e Asia, in Africa, and in the Middle East. As I start wrapping up, I would like to mention a few things about the features of the post 9-11 world and a global socialization in the making, as I call it, which has, it seems to me, emerged against such a background, the background that I have just painted for you. And so I would submit to you that we can identify, amongst other themes, certainly, and certainly not in a um, comprehensive manner, seven dominant characteristics of this era, which I will list in bullet points for our discussion. First one is the militarization of international affairs. I think this is the most important, the most visible, the most consequential. Wars all around us, unceasingly, conflict, interventionism. This has been essentially this kind of staccato period. One author calls it the Gulf, or the, rather the 9-11 wars. Militarization of international affairs. Secondly, the weakening or the instrumentalization of the rule of law. Violations here and there recodifications, stripping away. Most obviously seen around the world, north and south. This sort of approach where the rule of law is something that could be manipulated and used for purposes other than the very principles that are supposed to underscore justice. Thirdly, the securitization of society. Surveillance, control, violence, soft violence, hard violence, unseen, seen violence. Generally, the notion that everything in our interaction societally has been somehow translated under the theme of the lens of security. Fourthly, the normalization of discriminatory discourses. Racism, obviously, sexism, hate speech. There's a sense that those types of oppositions, which have always been present throughout history, as I mentioned earlier, have somehow, when they were supposed to be on their way to be managed, or if, there I say, disappeared, have made a bit of a comeback, as we've seen so vividly in recent years. Fifthly, the monetization of democracy. Not merely the crisis of democracy, which we discuss often in Europe, but this notion that democracy has somehow also been hijacked, manipulated, dispossessed, rewritten in that sense. We see it in processes of transitions to democracy, in the global south, we see in existing democracies that are taking steps back 
across Europe, across North America, across Latin America, and Asia, and elsewhere. Sixthly, the return of authoritarianism, which is related to the previous points, but stands alone. It speaks the language of autocracy. It speaks the language of dictatorship. It speaks the language of force. This is what we see in Brazil. This is what we see in the United States. This is what we see in Egypt. This is what we see in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE, etc. But also, and I want to finish on the seventh positive dynamic, the revival of social movements and pushback by citizens. I see that the past 20 years have featured around the world. We see it with the Arab Spring. We see it in the movements across the world since then, at every single level. The revival of these movements that speak a language of revolution, of insurgency, of rebellion. Ways to essentially try, not necessarily successfully, but try to draw a line in opposing this force. In and around stands a larger, more complex issue, the nature and the place occupied by the citizenry in relation to these transformations. With access to more information, and now I'm moving to mention a bit of a, a paradox, today's citizenry is paradoxically, arguably, less free than the previous one. Citizens have become confined to a set of ever-controlled spaces, lacking agency when they command more information, command more control, arguably, over these new geographies, including theirs, the citizens are fast, including their bodies, the citizens are fast losing their ability to understand, much less make the world. But the anxiety of the post 9 11 woman and the man is as visited by police state practice as some sort of self imposition. You could say that it's a reaction, you could say that it's a defense mechanism, you could say that there's no choice to be debated, but it's certainly something where that agency is there, or the lack uh, thereof, rather. We can list other softer but equally important traits of our time, the death of nuance, the malleability of facts, in the intellectual uniformization, which we see in academia, which we see in the media, which we see generally in policy making. It is easy for me to imagine that the next great division of the world will be between people who wish to live as creatures and people who wish to live as machines, wrote the American novelist Wendell Berry. This begs the question, therefore, of who is in the driving seat in this period, and the, more importantly, the coming one. Much has been made of the neoliberal order, and to be certain, capital occupies a central place. The corporate world has set the terms of exchange and around us, and has given the rat race of order run for its money. But in closing, I want to highlight the responsibility and the ethics that we be, should be looking for. If these are the challenges of two decades of conflict and mistrust, haven't we lost more by such individual tribalization of the world, the what's in it for me, what do I gain from this, why should I care, news that matter to you, iPhone, YouTube, MySpace, Facebook, Yahoo. Such automated bottom line and cut to the chase logic has been underwriting a sort of infantilization of people, which I argue prevents us from tackling with responsibility the complexity of these issues. These roads were traveled before not merely 20 years ago, but decades ago. And so back to the question that we started with, do we write history to provide closure, or do we write history to understand and learn from? And the question is therefore that we are in, face, in the face of a fully familiar sequence. What eventually came to be known as the totalitarian century started 100 years ago, in a similar moment of both a promise of modernity and the advance of mesmerizing technology. For all we know historically, there is a repetitive cycle of advance and pushback. That's the glass half full. This does not necessarily mean today a fatalistic disposition, which I certainly do not argue for towards power politics, but rather self-introspection and a re-examination of our history and the persistence of the deeper issues we need to come to grips with, with urgency 20 years after 9-11. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, of course, after this speech, I have many questions, so I take my position of privilege to start. Uh, there's a point that you've raised that seems to me crucial. Um, it's this entanglement between uh, 
um, on the one hand, you know, this disruption, systemic disruption of the rule of law, and at the same time, the mobilization of discourses of human rights, of uh, democracy building in order to justify these interventions. Um, and there is, there is still some reflections um, that are growing within the academia, notably through the work of Talal Assad, of this relationship between you know, humanitarianism and violence. Um, and I wanted to push you a little bit further in that direction, how you understand these entanglements and how can we disentangle this discourse? Certainly that entanglement has a deep history, as, as you pointed out. Uh, humanitarianism, I think, needs to be questioned. It, it, it has been questioned increasingly, but it needs to be questioned in relationship to this DNA, which only presents so often um, sort of the uplifting and the positive and the liberating dimension, therefore hiding what has often been a problematic relationship to power. The humanitarian dominant narrative that has emerged is very much related to particular places in the world which were simultaneously projecting power and control um, and occupation um, for the past 200 years. And so if you choose to speak that language while, as many humanitarians have done, without necessarily seeing that which you're also carrying in relation to those populations, actors, spaces, values you speak to, I think in a way there's a sense of, I spoke of amnesia earlier, and, and of closing spaces that need to be somehow questioned. I think this is part of the re-examination that the humanitarian world has to do much more of, generally. I, I think there's been some step forwards, but I do believe that that's very much a work in progress that humanitarians have to tackle. It's related, but slightly different to sort of the adventure of human rights, which is a bit more recent in its modern formulation, you know, post-World War II and linked to the birth of the United Nations, and I, I tend to see a bit of a, a key moment in the 90s where there's a reaffirmation of those values, as I mentioned. But the question of human rights suffers something different, which is, and you alluded to this in your comment, or at least how I understand it, something of a hijacking by now, in this case, more power. I think states around the world have become much more, I think, tactical about it. They see that it's too hard, too, too complex, too counterproductive to have this in-your-face power and sort of essentially dismiss the question of human rights. So there's a sense of reappropriation, repackaging that we see happening in relation to this. And very much so in the context of 9-11, we see the question of, of, of human rights almost redefined. The conversation about torture, which I'm often surprised that the current generation has, has, has forgotten, or maybe because it, we have not you know, mentioned it enough, it was very shocking in the early days, and you might recall those rationalizations by eminent professors around the world saying that, you know, should we torture? Maybe torture is acceptable by democracies, no less. I mean, we're not talking by, you know, police states that do this. And processes that I should have mentioned, such as rendition, for instance, where you dispatch people to particular countries where they will be tortured and then brought back into a legal process. This is kind of the tapestry of things we've been playing, seen to circumvent the direct violation uh, of that. The net result is, is that uh, 15 years later, actually even before the current phase, we've seen gradually an acceptance of that, so much so that these violations that could be now per performed uh, almost openly. And we see that particularly in the United States where the, the sort of the demise of, of, of justice, social justice, tensions, spoke a language that skipped about 30, 40 years of progress in that sense. So I do believe that humanitarians and human rights are very much at the heart of this kind of transaction. And they've, they've been under attack, certainly uh, in this period, for sure. Right. Um, you know, I would have um, another kind of puzzle um, to raise when I listen to your talk, um, which was related to um, what you mentioned, what you called, and you repeated twice, the this, this degeneration of the terms of exchange in global affairs. The degeneration of the terms of exchange in global affairs. And I think you gave us a view of what this degeneration looks like. Um, but you also talk about, you know, the um, mindset that 9-11 produced. Um, 
And I'm quite interested in that aspect. How would you describe the post 9-11 mindset? Who have we become as global people um, who are unfortunately part of that mindset? Thank you. I think this is really, I think you put your, your finger on what I really wanted to get across, which is this kind of um, complexity of 9-11. And I really wanted to stay away from this whole security-driven conversation we're all tired of and have heard and heard again. And this is the point about calling up history and, and, and what it tells us about what we're observing and, and who we are. So if you, if, you, if you try an analogy and say, start this conversation in 1965, looking at 1945, you would be able to see this arc of how the world had moved in those 20 years. What were the values that were introduced? What were the different mindsets? So clearly st stuck into the Cold War by then, as opposed to coming out of the trauma of World War. There are dynamics, meta-dynamics that materialized. I think the story of 9-11 becomes more important after 9-11 than 9-11. 9-11 is the most important terrorist attack in history by one of the most powerful groups against the most powerful country. But this magnitude is almost, almost kind of immediately closing that conversation. I mean, what more can you say once the towers fall? This is it. What really becomes of interest to me in observing that is what happens to us in the next phase. So as these wars play out, as we sort of taken into that, I think there's a socialization in the making, as I call it, because I think it's still on ongoing. And that socialization speaks a certain language, it has a certain coding, it has a certain imagery Images are super important in this period. The plasticity of this, how this kind of gives us new keys to supposedly understand the world, but in fact, we are working on redefining our relationship to the world, and not necessarily in positive ways, which is the message. And don't shoot the messenger. I'm just here to give you some keys of analysis, although I keep insisting on the optimism. But it's not the greatest of period. It is a period of closing. It is a period of mistrust. And because there is this kind of transaction with the world out there in which these codes are being sort of somehow penetrating us, I do think that the challenge has to, to be about how we avoid being corrupt by this. I spoke about the mesmerizing role of technology that it enables us to do all these fantastic things. But doesn't it in a way sort of creates a bit of a coldness vis-a-vis -vis those things that matter those things that are, we keep talking about all the time and teach and study here and write about books and dissertations and papers. And we treat them almost kind of as a, a commodity, a distant commodity. Um, and I think this, this gap has somehow grown more urgent. Uh, we see it in the crisis. For, we call it the crisis. It's a right, migration. We see it in the, in the migration situation in 2014 where these this whole kind of um, situation is looked upon as, as a problem that has to be solved you know, in a technocratic manner, a bureaucratic manner, and therefore less humane way in that sense. Right, so I want to open the floor you now for uh, the discussion, for questions you may have. Thank you, Mahmoud, for answering my questions. Um, does anyone would like to intervene? Please don't be shy. Yes, please. Hi. Um, Would you like to take the microphone? Mm -hmm. um. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, that was really interesting. My question is, what are, the, well, what are the consequences of remembering history in this very singular way related to a single space and moment and point in time? And you kind of questioned the, uh, it's almost incredulous how we managed to, to create a history around a one, one single space in time. And on September 11th of this year, everybody from President Obama to ev everyone that was you know, having moments of silence for this, for this uh, phenomenon that happened. But then, what, so what are, the, what are the consequences of remembering history in this way? And what, are the role, what role does academia have to play in reshaping this history? And how can we make sure that that transcends through into policy and learning? Because I feel like there, there, there is this kind of silo where we discuss this and everybody knows about the, the human rights violations of the United States, but somehow that doesn't seem to feature in, in public memory with this public amnesia that you're talking about. So 
what role do we have as historians and, and hopefully future academics to, to change this and reshape this history? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll start with the second part of your question. Um, and so, to be very explicit about this, I think academia has failed spectacularly when it comes to the whole 9-11 period. You know, many such moments in history where we could look at how historians, particularly in social scientists, political scientists generally, or sociologists, tagged along, um, presented things in euphemistic ways, uh, only to wake up 20 years later because someone wrote a book about this and the paradigm has shifted, and now we're in this logic, how could we? And then all of a sudden it becomes normalized and the story is being told with a bit of a kind of a um, ex post facto normalization where for many, many years those keys were not given to um, the students, were not given to the audience at large. So I think looking at this thing, and, and, and Julie kindly mentioned the fact that I've been working on this for a while now, Frankly, all of the facts were there from day one, really. You know, there's very good investigative journalism that was available, the story there. It's not that complicated, you know, there's not that much conspiratorial aspects around it. And, and the dynamics that we see playing, by the way, were playing out already in the peers before. The United States has been in this imperial mode already in the 90s in Iraq, the Gulf War that I mentioned. We've seen the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. We've seen the European dynamics of colonialism all along. So none, none of this is in fact completely, everything changes after 9-11 is most of the first sentence of most of these books, which is actually misleading. You know, things evolve in the particular way we've been discussing, but most of that story was available. But the chape de plomb, as they call it, they call it in French, was so strong at the time that it was extremely difficult for anyone to step up to have the courage the intellectual courage may be the answer straightforwardly to your question. The guts to actually call a spade a spade and see that's what's happening. In fact, at the time, the only voices that you could say literally doing so did not come from academia. They were novelists, Norman Mailer, for instance, or sci-fi writers, Kurt Vonnegut, um, artists that spoke and said these things when you expected them from academia, whose role is to answer your question, to document, to analyze, to provide context, to inform, to educate. That is not the role of artists. They're there to inspire, to do other things. But so we missed on that big time. And so I think this is something that has to be registered with a bit of humility and I think honesty in terms of that. In terms of the first part of your question, 9-11 um, is also a very special event. There is always peculiarities to define, as you said, events at one place, one moment, and, and beam them in that way. Previously, that was done from a position of power, right? So that a, an event is presented as being global, but it's not really completely global. It may be European, it may be Asian, it may be African, it may be becoming global by interest, by virtue of the fact that we share it, but it's not eminently, inherently global in that sense. 9-11 comes after 10 years of globalization. It is something that is beamed live, it's followed live, it involves transnational actors coming from Asia and Africa and the Middle East and Europe and it's in the United States and it's all followed live. I mean, once the first plane hits, everyone can follow the second plane live. It has this postmodern nature that I would say. So I feel like saying that the fact that now we follow this event at the same time has a certain objective reality around it. It is also because it's taking place the heart of the galaxy, New York, at the most powerful kind of actor. And the most powerful non-state actor, Al-Qaeda, is not any group for that matter. So the combination of this gives you quite an optimal position to start with and the live following of that. So I do think that in that way, it is very much a very, um, um, it, a French author called it at the time, l'événement absolu, the absolute event. And I think it, it really partakes of that kind of dynamic. So today, to go back and reflect about that, there's a certain kind of, I'd, I'd say, normal dimension to this. Uh, but as I said, the event, I tend to separate 9-11, the day, the event, or what came before it, to what came after that, the, the, the long shadow uh, of where we are uh, in that sense. Thank you. More question? Yes? Hi, Professor. Thank you for this uh, illuminating, illuminating talk. Um, 
My question concerns what you've described as the aftermath or the 9-11 era that in your opinion might be coming to a close with a new era possibly unleashed by the COVID crisis. But um, I'm an economist and for me there was another big key and fundamental event in the meantime. And of course I'm referring to the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009 and its many spillovers. So since Professor Bio, you mentioned uh, disentanglement, how do you disent disentangle things and trends that might result from 9-11 or that might result from the global financial crisis? Do you see some trends as being amplified or as having been amplified by both events? Do you feel like the global financial crisis also contributed to this dereglement, which I'm having a hard time translating into English, of the world? And what's, what's the interplay between those two crises? Because for me, both events are key and fundamental when defining this post 9-11 era. Thank you. Of course, thank you. It's an excellent question. And they are very much related. Uh, so as a non-economist, I tend to completely forget about this dimension. <laughs> when I recently sent my proposal for the fourth volume, my editor sent it back and said, fantastic, where's the economic crisis of 2008? Which is exactly your question. I said, oh, and then we're adding now a chapter. So, um, Yes, of course. I think that obviously it plays a huge role. Um, I would say the following, um, maybe two things. I would say one, uh, in this kind of long aftermath, uh, and, and I thought you were going towards the closure of it, maybe we can come back to whether it's actually ended or not. But in this, in this kind of long aftermath, I think that there's a series of way stations, moments, sort of highlights that are actually contributing to this dereglement, right? And we can highlight a few of those, right? We can think immediately geopolitically in terms of wars, conflicts, Syria, the ISIS story. The, t the 2010s also add a, sort of a layered nature to this. You go from AQ to ISIS, you go from the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq to Syria. There's a kind of an expansion and normalization of that dereglement. But there's also other things that are not necessarily geopolitical and I mentioned the world of culture, the world of the social tension, the inner kind of transformation within these societies, and clearly, of course, the, the economic disturbances of a large magnitude historically that come after 2008. In a way, I think there's a bit of an aftershock that comes in relation to the economic tension points of the late 90s, the 1998 kind of uh, advanced notice of that in terms of the language that we see playing out. But I see also that it's very much related in, in how the states decide to handle that. And so the authoritarians that I mentioned, this kind of reappropriation of the mechanisms, of the controls, of the solutions, is very much spelled in the manner in which at least the United States government decides to do the bailout decides to sort of you know, work in that particular fashion as opposed to another possible exit. And so in relation to this, you see that it's deepening the disempowerment that I spoke of earlier. The economic depth of that, the social um, troubles that would come later on, and something that plays out globally, very much related to this. So by all means, the economic crisis adds um, sort of, we spoke about agency, there's less and less agency on the part of people, but there's also more reasons for the, the state, moving out to the state, to start speaking more forcefully this language of control, which it did in terms of security, it does it now in terms of the economy, and soon enough it will speak the same language in terms of health, as we saw uh, by the time we get to, to COVID. And I think in that way, this tapestry of control, that's why I highlighted control, I think is not accidental. I, I think it's, it's gradually reinforcing. And it speaks the language of crisis, of interventionism. You intervene on the economy. You intervene militarily. There's a sense of that particular kind of, it's as if it's the only language we can speak of, right? And, and I think it builds a certain despotic demand on the part of the citizenry. And that's where I would also fault us. I, 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 this is the kind of the finger pointing to the US that I said earlier, or to the states even. I think it's too easy a way out of this. I think that there is a responsibility to have this kind of uh, pushback. Um, and, I, and that's why I highlighted the pushback that we see across the world also during this period as something of note. Thank you very much for your question. There is one more, one more question behind um, uh, Mike. Thanks very much. Very um, illuminating, thought-provoking talk. Uh, 
as you're talking now, it strikes me how many interesting parallels there are between 9-11 and the COVID pandemic in terms of the kind of state of exception and, and the ways that states sometimes use this to expand their authorities and, and powers, um, you know, whether it's in the name of protecting us from the war on terror or protecting public health. And I just wonder if you've reflected on that at all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, very much so. In fact, we, we started doing this in the students in my class last s spring uh, of last year. As uh, so the class is on this very much history of post 9-11. And so the class had been designed, the course had been designed essentially as, a, as an examination, as a closed examination, as a sharply etched one of those 20 years. But then we had this event. And as we went through it, as we literally adapted, as we all did, um, it seemed to me that we were possibly in the presence of the epilogue to these 20 years. And so we started testing that in that conversation. Um, and I think back to uh, the volume that I spoke to the gentleman a minute ago, I think this is where I'm heading to possibly draw as a conclusion that I do believe that um, if we think in terms of decades, and there's no reason to think that way historically, that it's also problematic historically, that we tend to think in these portions of time. But if we think in terms of decades, maybe very neatly, right, um, the virus, the pandemic, the crisis, everything you alluded to, marks the beginning of a new moment of a global kind of experience, right? So if 9-11 was a global experience around security as defined, narrowly in that sense, um, then I think this sequence may have, one, run its course when a new contender is pushing it out, right? Because this is the conversation now and it's changing everything. Just as we had to adapt in airports 20 years ago, now we have to adapt in having some sort of software being cleared before you guys get in the room here. So th there's changes that are very much transforming our relationship to that. But I think the very important lesson, and that's why I qualified it earlier, of 9-11, is that its legacy, its insidious legacy, has actually made it to the post-COVID phase, which speaks the language of control, of security, of threat. Now it's a virus. Before that, it was these terrorists, right? Um, of all of these dimensions of intervention, of savior, right? who's going to save us from this, the control that we hand to the military. It's very interesting to see briefings last spring uh, on the pandemic made in, I think, Spain and in other countries by um, military officers, right? We've seen in this country, in, in Switzerland, how the military was, were called up to assist uh, in hospitals, only to have the people in the hospital saying they actually have no role to play. We're doing very well. Thank you. Uh, but it was kind of a normal kind of you know, call for such intervention. There's a certain mindset. And I think this, that's what I would say that it's a tapestry of things connecting, uh, lands very neatly before the pandemic arrives. We start the pandemic with a portfolio of things that 9-11 gave us, right? It's these tools that we have processed, we have sequenced, we have accepted them. This is how we go into airports. This is how we talk to each other. This is how we think about security, right? Uh, forget about human rights and humanitarians, etc. We think about these things in that particular way. And so comes the pandemic, right? Which is only a virus, with all due respect. It's only a virus. And historians will tell you that we've had pandemics plenty in history. We think of it in those terms. Um, and, and so there's a, there is a relationship. There is a, I would say there is a, it's, we have bequeathed the 9-11 mindset uh, into, uh, onto rather, um, the, the current phase, for sure. Thank you very much. Dan is giving me a sign that some people are, uh, want to ask questions, so people who are online. Indeed, indeed, we have a few questions online. Uh, there's about six minutes left in the session, so I'll ask this one first and we'll see what we have time for. But, um, so here's the question. After World War II, there was an important movement against war and there was the development of human rights. It seems that after 9-11, we are living the contrary. Continuous wars accepted by some states and some groups in the general public and a degradation of human rights. How do you see this paradigm shift? Thank you very much. This is the degeneration that, that I was talking about. This is really fundamental either. And I think we have to look into this and I say again, don't shoot the messenger. You know, to tell you positive stories, I could tell you and we have all these positive things that bring us together. But 9-11 works on the logic of fear, right? Empire fear is the title of a book that comes at the time. And as a result of this, what we have seen, I would say to the person, thank you for your question, is I, I see very rapidly 
kind of this very much big bang with which the whole post 9-11 starts, which is a theme of beware. Beware of these Muslims, beware of these guys, beware of these things. It creates a certain kind of threat. Uh, and we have processed it. So much so that anything that comes is in that sense. Now, having said that, human nature works in, 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 in very interesting ways and, and there's always that possibility of pushback. I find it very interesting that 10 years into the 9-11 story, you have the Arab Spring. And I always say I've never seen a march against terrorism in the Middle East during those years, right? But I've seen a march for rights, for injustice, for against authoritarianism. So for all the noise these security partners were making in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in Tunisia, you had people actually being concerned with the trampling on their rights. So they wake up in 2011, that generation, by the way, to push back for that. Now, the story of the Arab Spring is different, and it goes on to the degeneration of the wars in Syria and so on. But it's very interesting that smack in the middle of, of, of that 9-11 sequence, you have a push for rights, very clearly speaking the language of democracy, uh, of this kind of, you know, um, the carnival, you called it in your book, right, that in Afghanistan and elsewhere, about these particular kind of, of, of values. So there was a pushback. There was a pushback in different places, just as is a, there's a pushback for racial justice in the United States, just as there's a pushback for social justice in many places across Europe, right? Los Indignados, Les Indignés, all of these movements that we see in Ukraine, Hong Kong, around the world, all of the movements in sub-Saharan Africa, and we've seen in Chad, in, in, in Burkina Faso, in Senegal, we've been, they've seen a lot of that pushback simultaneously with this. But to the question, globally, I think we've been kind of bamboozled into this narrative. It's, it's as if we're paralyzed by the magnitude of the 9-11 thing. It's so big. Terrorism, the US, Al-Qaeda, ISIS. You know, I can't produce a counter-narrative to this. You know, otherwise, it's, it's too big, it's too dangerous. But I think that narrative is now tired. I think 20 years into this, people are realizing that um, th there's, there's a necessary questioning. And it may not be of the story itself, because we're beyond it, but it might be of the zeitgeist, of the mindset. That there's a need, I think, for more uh, reappropriation of the tools, um, uh, and therefore of the terms of exchange, as we'd say. Is there still time for another question? Uh, we'll do, we'll do see if there's, a, if there's a minute to answer in this question. So on the topic of the Arab Spring, so the person's asking, I'm wondering, you mentioned the issue of Arab Spring as the symbol of a larger and deeper trend, a population desire to have real impacts and influences on their society. But will this be reduced or limited or not so effective due to the lack of effective tools for the population education? Should we understand this absence of educative system as a way by the former authorities to keep populations under control? Is freedom really freedom without education? I, thank you very much. I completely uh, agree with the person who asked the, the question. And I would say above and beyond civil society, which has been celebrated a lot in the Arab Spring. You remember we spoke a lot about the fact that Tunisia, for instance, had a very vibrant civil society or Egypt, and that's, this could somehow help the process move forward. Well, I think we've seen with the collapse of the processes in those two countries, uh, or at least it's endangering in Tunisia, um, we've seen that civil society is not enough because it may, it's simply an agent. I think what is important is the milieu. And the milieu, as in the language, the, the pool of things, I think that comes back all the time to knowledge and to education because it's an empowering, it's a self-empowering tool. And by having that, you're able to push back against these authoritarian regimes, which did very well in manipulating that opening in that sense. So I think absolutely, I can only highlight in the corridors of this place, of course, the importance of education. But I do think that strategically, it may be the way out that is irresistible for power because an educated citizenry, an educated population is able to essentially have the regeneration to push back against that authoritarianism uh, with more intelligence, with more versatility, with more agility, uh, as opposed to simply you know, being bamboozled by a narrative, as we were saying. Great, thank you. I think we'll, we'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Mahmoud. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, and we wish you a very nice uh, day. Thank you.